you're going to in a minute. She is a incredible human being. I met her maybe sometime last year. She got onto the radar in my world through winning the NADOC Sports Person of the Year. She is uh, a puncher, a fighter. I hate introducing people like that because then they think that you're just a psycho. That like, <laughs> But we do have our guest, our 7.30, no, it's a 7.42 guest and it doesn't matter about time at all because you'll be able to watch this back uh, anytime on reallygoodradio.com.au. Welcome to the show, Marissa Williamson. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, cool. Thanks for coming. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. That's okay. That's okay. It's nice that I, I love that uh, you're a good friend of Haley's, aren't you, who was on this show? Yeah. Well, that was um, back in the footy days, but yeah, we're really good friends. Oh, are you a footy player too? I was. I, I um, wanted to be, I wanted to play AFL before I got on to doing boxing. That's actually how I stumbled uh. into boxing because I wanted to have that elite fitness. I wanted to mm. um, trial for the Western Jets and make the... BFL side and then AFL side and then I just fell in love with the sport. Fell in love with boxing? Yeah. I I, I find that a unique mindset because uh, I'm scared of being punched in the head for ongoingly and <laughs> like, you know, for, <laughs> for, for fun. When I um, won the NADOC award, I um, was at the flag ceremony, the flag ceremony and everyone thought I won it from footy because I was just like, <laughs> the crazy tackle. Like I was basically punching one on the field. So <laughs> not much <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, I'm trying to, for people that don't know about AFL, which if you're in Australia, you'd have to be blind, but we do have listeners from over the world. Um, mm. Like relate to a, can you relate your style of footy to a current day player or any player that's kind of famous? Like are you a bit of a, um, like an enforcer on the field? Like who, who, what kind of, what kind of game did you have on the footy field? I would just run through you. Like I was, <laughs> <laughs> you just. Woof, like really, just really a tank. You're going through them. Yeah, I was just running through. I played the whole thing too. It was pretty fit. <laughs> I love this. I can tell that you're serious. You're a toughie. I'm, yeah, I'm dead set serious. When I left, <laughs> I was went from being six, 76 to 69 to 64 to 58 because that's how much like leg muscle I lost. Oh, right, right. <laughs> so you're basically like... Uh, Basically, John O'Brown. Do you know Glenn Archer? No, no you might might be a bit before. Like, how old are you? I did. I eighteen. Yeah. Get lost. I am eighteen. Get lost. Eighteen. Your resume is ridiculous. It's I, just, I, it I doesn't c- even feel real. Like <laughs> <laughs> when you're typing all those things, you're like, yeah. yeah I'm like, what? I was like typing it, and I was like, oh, I forgot about this. Oh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> that's like my um, uh, that's like my um encouragement award trophies I used to get when I was little. I've got like I've got to work out kind of which. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Every kid gets a trophy in my day. Every kid gets a trophy, <laughs> which I totally disagree with. But mate, I have got loads of encouragement. I, I'll bring them on. I can go get them at the back there. I still keep them. I still keep them. <laughs> okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. It's uh encouragement award was pretty much probably because I was crying my head off asking where's my trophy. And they probably engraved one. But no, I want to read. I gotta read your Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um you so you're the you're the current hang on. Before we go from football to uh to basketball and deal with sport, tell us a little bit about your youth. Um where did you grow up? Um who are you? Well, Who's your mom? <laughs> Let's um, unpack that. I'm a proud non dirty woman from South Australia. Um, I did mention that I grew up in foster care, um, and that's kind of just a common thing. Um, there's a lot of violence and mental health issues in my family, and that just ended in a family breakdown, and that just resulted in me being in foster care for a really long time. Um, How long are we talking, Marissa? Five years. Um, but I was already starting to kind of dip my toe by the age of seven. Um, kind of just mm. police 
Goldman and mm. DHS and we didn't really know like we didn't really have much involvement with VACA at that point because I don't really know um, how developed it was at the time because it was so long ago but they just weren't involved with us so just a lot of stuff was happening that was just really confusing um, mm. to me and my family and so we're all kind of disconnected now um, none of us talk yeah. but that's all right things happen so mm. Um, I hear that. It's a, it's a funny, it's an interesting, funny, got to stop using that word. It's an interesting way, I find it interesting how people round off what they say when they come off the back of something pretty serious, like it's emotional, like 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 you're connected to that, like it's not like, oh yeah, by the way, this happened once upon a time and what did you get up to, you know, when you were a kid, like it's serious stuff and stuff that we have to be really considerate of and uh, aware of and we have to try and um, not allow it to continue to happen to other people like it's not a it's not a brilliant way it's not like you we don't we don't prepare our kids to be brought up that way but you kind of say it with a it's all right like and that's just the kind of the way it is is that is that true to how you feel i think that for me i've already felt the hurt and i've mm. felt the hurt for a really long time i felt disconnected um I had a suicide attempt when I was 15. I've been pretty open about that on my social media, about um, promoting and mental health um, and going to seek help. I've definitely been using that, my story, to help other people. But um, I think I felt hurt enough and I think I was going down the wrong path in life because I just kept feeling hurt. And once I, once I kind of overcome that, I... It's opened so many doors to me. Um, I appreciate your sharing too, and I'm kind of relieved that I didn't ask something that you haven't been asked before. <laughs> I thought when I landed that question, that's probably a bit deep, but it, yeah. it's uh, it's hey, I, I don't know if you've heard this show, and, and my listeners would would hear this. We talk about and we promote and encourage people to wear your scars like a general wears their stars, and I find it it keeps popping up with these champions in the world. They are open about the toughest parts of their life. Mm. Um, you, you developed, where, where did you see, so you're in foster care. Uh, did you go to school? Did you go to, where did you grow up? In Geelong or are you always? In Werribee. Yeah, in Westie. Werribee. You're a Westie. Kind of, I was kind of just all over the place. Like I was in Geelong and the Malton and Melbourne. I was just everywhere. Mm. Um, did you do I well had- at school? Was school for you? In year nine, I wasn't. I was punching on. Mm. And kind of part of year 10 too. Um, <laughs> but my, we got a new principal. So I, I was moved to foster placement in Lara. And then that ended. So then I came back to Werribee. And when I got back to Werribee, I was like, I need to get back to school. Mm. Um, and I had to sit down with the principal. And he was a new principal. And um, I said... He said, I don't want a violent person in my school. And I was like, what, what is it going to, he's like, I don't want you here. And no one else, no other school in the suburb wants you at their school. I said, wow. look, what's it going to take for me to get into those classrooms? And he said, sign a contract. Footy, she got me a trial with the Long Falcons, got me um, in with Kickstart. Um, and I have to be on my best behaviour. I have to be getting the best scores in my classes for the majority of them. Um, and then it kind of just sprouted from there. Um, and then I was just head down, ass up type of thing. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know the landscape of those situations and it's a, it's a complete spectator generalisation, but I would think that a lot of people in your situation with uh, where you were at at that time to be told, nah, you're not coming in here at all and no other school will let you in unless you do this. Um, and for a response to go, I'm assuming you went, yeah, okay. No, I sat there and or, I was just... Or did you did you think of I was sat there and I was just... I got nicknamed Angry Angus. So I was sitting there like an Angry Angus, just... <laughs> It's really deep thought. I was like, I don't want to create 
like I don't want this cycle to keep on, on going in my life, um, in my family's life, in my like my family's past. And I was like, I want to create a new cycle for myself. I want to be the best person I can be. And that still that still took a really long time for me to like set everything up for me to be that person. I didn't meet all the right people. I didn't have the right tools in my toolbox to do that. I was still a very angry person and I was just really upset, really lost. Like how like how could my family have done this to me? I was just like kind of had that mentality, like mm. why is this me? Everyone else is so privileged and I'm not. Like why are all these white kids like this and I, I have to like struggle? Um and all these white teachers they don't understand like what I, I have to I have to stand in front of all my all my peers and talk about why I'm hungry or why I wasn't at school. Like it was it was really hard. Mm. Um, and then I, slowly along the way, um, I met people and they set me up. And now I'm yeah, I'm still going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was um? Can you recall a moment where you really thought, where you really believed? that the life that you seemingly were living and, and it was it was destined to go a, a negative way and it, you, were, you felt like you were heading this way. What was a moment or a person that, I mean, you've clearly got self-belief, you can tell that. Um, and it's it's somehow, in, it's inbuilt in all of us. We just got to kind of find it, I think, and find a reason. What, what was a time, what was a moment where you really started realising you can actually avoid the the um, predicted path or the, the expected path people telling you you can't do stuff and you come from these situations what who did, who did you you just said influential people was it a, a person or was it actually starting no, to get involved in sport it was definitely the sport um i met a, a moldy who was my coach and he really did um teach me about having discipline and he was all about discipline and it, he might have been people might have thought he was a bit extreme but he, he was extreme but if I even have 80 percent of what he told me to do I'm still far more disciplined than anyone else um he kind of taught me to be be better than everyone be a good student be a good community person be a good athlete um be the whole package but I think Breakdowns of those, like breakdowns of those relationships, like hurdles along the way, um, things never stop. Like, like bad things never stop happening. They always continue happening. Yeah. But the way I learnt to deal with it just got better, and that was probably from boxing. I developed a different level of self respect. No one, no one can touch me. No one, no one can treat me like that type of mentality because I'm, I, I box now. Like that type of mentality hmm. is there a difference between are you saying there's a difference between what boxing did for you and what afl football did for you 100 percent um i think afl i didn't i didn't do too well because i did well but i could have done better because i just there's just too much placement breakdown type of thing but hmm. i think boxing is you don't have a team supporting you the whole way it's just you you yeah. are by yourself you're hitting the bag by yourself you are in your own head should i keep going or should i stop um and i don't know just when you're walking into the ring and you're so scared and you have the ability to control your anxiety it's just and the people that i've met the just discipline is just second to none mm. um everything just changed like Everything. I didn't. I don't. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. Not, I don't do anything like that. Um, because, and I respect my my respect for elders is even way more than it was initially. Because that's just what he taught me. You have to respect your elders. You have to respect people above you. People who have been in the sport longer than you. Um, that respect was transferable in life. Mm. That I learned. Um. Why do you think it's important to respect elders? Other than them knowing lots, usually they know more than you. They 100% know but more than why is, you. Yeah, why do you, yeah. They are, they have all the knowledge and mm. they teach everything. Um, 
I don't know how to even say my own tribe's name properly. I've never been there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, Auntie Pam kind of just took me under her wing, yes. like, called me every day. Um, she, I sent her a photo of me driving a car and she was like, I hope you're wearing a halberd in there. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's oh, just she's amazing. She's amazing. Um, elders are just, mm. they're there to protect you and they're there to teach you and they're not going to teach you anything unless you're respectful. Arnie Pam's a brilliant human. She, she's lifted a fair few people up in, especially into that NADOC Sports Award. Um, it's her baby, you know, and being a, she's such a, a, how old is she? She's like in her late seventies and she's doing marathons and impressive overcome breast cancer. And um, I'm so glad to hear that you've got her as a buddy because she's just one of the best people to have in your corner. She's so Excuse sure. the pun, the, the boxing pun. She's like, what? I hope you're wearing a helmet in that car. <laughs> I was like, oh, Monty, it's a car. <laughs> there's one thing getting in the ring, but there's yeah. one thing uh, being good at it. Uh, you're getting punched in the head <laughs> the first time. Are you, yeah. But I mean, it sounds like you're already kind of up for the up for the punch in the head kind of attitude from you from your <laughs> from your history. You're I like, I got punched in the face. Just I, I got punched and I, like my first ever sparring, I just. I giggled. I was like, oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> How amazing. I was like, You oh, are a God. sicko. I literally I just, I just got obsessed with it after this point. I was just like, okay. Um I was just yeah, I loved it. Um yeah. You are you are designed for boxing. That's I think if you love getting punched in the face, go to the boxing ring and absorb all the love. But you can't, you can't, you can't get knocked down though. You got to make sure you get knocked down. Um, so uh, uh, boxing's defense, very disciplined. Um, defense, your defense has got to be strong. You, what type sorry. of boxer are you? For the first year, I was um, just would punch on. Like I don't, if I'm gonna get hit, I'm gonna get hit. I don't <laughs> care. Um, but it wasn't with amateur boxing. Like I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't hurt. But with amateur boxing, it's like it's a point system. So yeah, I could be beating her, but because I conceded punches on the way in trying to beat her, I lost points. So um, with my uh, when I left um, Vince Marino at Wyndham PCYC when that gym closed down, I went to James Rosler and at Ultimate Kickboxing for probably six months, and he was all about defense. All we ever did was defense. Wow. Um, sometimes we'd spar and the guy would just be trying to headbutt me and um, I would just have to be, my trunk defense just went from a one to a seven. <laughs> I've still got a long way to go. But now I'm with Cal Bryant at Collingwood um, Boxing Gym and because, you know, James sat down with me and he's like, you know, this is the kickboxing gym. And I was like, right. He's like, you're, uh, I think your boxing skills need to keep progressing and um I want to keep being in your corner, but I think that you should be in a box gym with um, more boxers for you to spar and with better females and just better talent. And I said, okay. So I was crying for like five days and I was like, okay, cool. Because he was like a father figure to me. I've right. never had a father So he, we still talk every few days now. And I was just like, oh, no, he wants to like end it because I was just so used to people leaving. I was just like, oh, he's going to leave. But it wasn't that. He was – um helping me and he was seeing that I have so much potential. So I went to Cal Bryant for only two weeks before lockdown and we have a really close bond now. He calls me like every few days. Um, I feel like I've been in with him my whole life and I've only actually trained at his gym a few times. Mm. So we are, we can start training. Well, I'm going to see him on Saturday. He's going to train me on Saturday. I've been training with Jason Marley. He's a five-time Australian champion. He's an Olympian as well. He just qualified for the 2021 20, um, Tokyo Olympics. So he's been training me too. Um, you talked, you just touched, dabbled on um, people leaving you, abandonment. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty common with single parent families or, um, you know, it's probably a lighter situation than what you mean, but definitely fostering care. You're not um, instability in the home quite early on. People coming in and out, um, even people that are trying to are great influences. Eventually, they, you know, they're not attached to you from a family sense. They're, they're your friend, but they don't they don't stick around in that relationship as uh, as available as they always were. How 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 do you how are you um, 
dealing with that and um, yeah, ha- ha- how do you deal with that? Um, that's a really good question. Because it hurts. I, like it, hurt, it, it hurts when people... Even really now, like, like ever since I started boxing again, like some family have can't tried coming back. Mm. And I think that hurts me more than them leaving because they're only coming back because now I have worth. It's, it's kind of, and I think that's like a classic boxing story, which it will, mm. that will always happen. It happens to every, every good fighter. I think my abandonment issues, I um, during when I left care at 18, um, I lived with um, an old social worker. She wasn't a social worker at Bakker anymore, but we, she came to my state title fight. She came to my graduation mm-hmm. and I lived with her and um, I hadn't lived in a black household for such a long time. Like she's gotten, she's got Keen's curry all over the house. <laughs> like, David. She's, like, she's basket weaving on the weekend. Like, do, you want some lemon, do you want some lemon metal tea? And I was like, That's thank you, auntie. Uh, and we had an argument one night and uh, I, said, I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. She was like, what are you talking about? We're just having a conversation. I'm not gonna, like we can argue, we can we can fight. It doesn't mean that um, our relationship is over. And as soon as she said that, I was just like, oh, Oh, it kind of like light bulb effect. I was like, oh, hmm. So I've been thinking about it a lot more now. Mm. And I think I don't care if you kind of stay or go now. It's kind of like, mm. well, if you're a good, if if I, if we have a good relationship and um, if you stick around, then that's good. Mm. But it's not going to be, I'm going to be in meltdown if you leave. Um, I'll just keep moving on with my life. I think that, Val, uh, yeah, um, being a kid, validation's kind of your life. Like you want, you want, you know, you're in the schoolyard and yeah. popularity is just like your main goal. When you want to wake up, you want to fit in, and it's really hard to get out of it. Um, and any kid, um, until you start kind of working out kind of what's real and what's not, it takes people a long time. But sometimes in sad, sadder circumstances or tougher, so you can you, you get more sharper on that because you don't want to get hurt so much. Um, it's just impressive that. Um, you're still here and doing what you're doing. Um, uh, and three fights under your belt. What happens? As in fighting? Like yeah. What yeah. Um, you're only a few fights in and you, you, you tasted success. So it's pretty funny. So I had to get to, yes, you have to have three fights before you get, can call, go and do, fight for a title. So right. I got, I got two fights. I already had one fight. At the end of 2018, in December. How did it go? I broke, my, I, broke, I broke my arm playing footy, so I had to. I would have had an extra 10 months worth of um, fights. If, but here we are. We're still Australian champion a year later. Um, <laughs> so I had to get two fights up. So I did two weeks worth of fights back to back. Went to Sydney, and then I went to sit back to Sydney the week later. And this is in year 12, and I um. I was in the weigh-in and some Aboriginal guy's behind me and he's like, because a lot of people lie about their fights. And he's like, how many fights you've had? And I called him with Ruth. <laughs> and um, cause I was just, I was just ripped up. I was just ripped and I was just physically had, I just looked ripped. I just looked <laughs> at physical capability. And that's kind of how it was so easy for me to get good. Yeah, sure. All right. So it was this guy's fight, fight show. And um, he, the only fighter the whole night he cornered was um, this girl that I was fighting. I was like, oh, no, she's we're going to be really good. Like, she's going to be, she's going to smash me. She was 24 at the time. I was 17. I was like, I'm, it was a pro-amateur show, so everyone was drunk. And it was just like real, it was a pro-fight show pretty much. Yeah, right. And we go on there. And then everyone's just screaming like, kill her. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so um, she uh, actually, I didn't, like, this was just, it happened. Like, I didn't even plan for this to happen. Um, I throw a massive hook in the second round, left hook, and she stepped into it and she went halfway across the ring. And that's how I kind of met um, the Australian boxing coach who um, told me, called Marcus Amato and 
um, Victoria, uh, Marissa Williamson, get her on the Futures team. And um, wow. I went to the Futures team and everyone's talking about chunk defense and footwork and stuff. And I was like, I don't know what this means. What you, <laughs> I've never heard this before. Like, what is chunk defense? And I was like, I felt so out of place, like counter punching and yeah. carrying using all this language I just didn't understand. Um, so I fought for the state title against another Aboriginal girl. Every all the all my titles have been with Aboriginal girls. Is that, um, is that de- hang on? Is that deliberate, or is there a lot of is there a lot of Aboriginal g- girls in fighting? I don't know, but all the girls I have not I fought, I fought mostly white girls, but what when I I was like oh no she can I know she can pack a punch. I was just <laughs> a whole, whole mobs there. And I was like oh my gosh. We became best friends after this fight. <laughs> wow. But, we went on a New Zealand boxing tour together and we still talk all the time. Um, I stepped out of the ring and there's Jamie Pittman and Caitlin Parker, which is, she's like one of the highest ranked female fighters in Australia. And I was like, oh my God, it's Caitlin Parker. I was like, Ugh! and she's talking to me and I was like, ah. and then I've had another, I had, had another. I love it. I don't know how many fights I had last year. I had 16 fights. Wow. So with that, that and the national, like, I fought in Tasmania, I fought in Sydney, Queensland, Victoria. And, and what's your record? What's your record over those 16 fights for, for last year or this year or whatever? I don't know, actually. Have you I lost know. any? I, I've definitely lost some. Um, yeah, okay. Definitely got chucked into the ring with... Um, I only ever fought elites and I was a youth, so all the all the people I was fighting were adults. And that's kind of um, what probably gave me that 1% when I was fighting a youth fighter at, at the Nationals because I was like, okay, well, I've been just being bashed this whole year by... Uh, adults so um when yeah. i got it was kind of um kind of good and then i went to the nationals and that was when i had a, a foster care placement with um my previous coach he was my coach so so like a few months leading up to the nationals I was training myself and i was like oh he's gonna come back he's i was hoping he was gonna let me come back and it just never happened so i was kind of just training myself and it just wasn't good and then i um i was caught a train for three hours to get some sparring um, at one of the other Victorian coaches' gyms and he's like, you're going to win a gold medal. I was like, how do you know I'm going to win a gold medal? My sparring was ridiculous. Just standing. He's like, because you caught a train for three hours to get sparring. And um, went to the Nationals. Lydia Thorpe set that up. She got funding. Um, bless her. Got on, she got me on the plane and it was like when I, my hand went up, she was another black girl. <laughs> when my hand went up, it was like just tears of relief. I was mm. just like, it's like the whole community had one. Everyone had called me and they're like, good job, sis. So like you did it. And I was just like, it was like a win for everyone. Um, Cause it was such a, a mate. It was just such a big moment. The whole year would just been so hard. Yeah. <laughs> Talked, I, I highly touched on it. Um, and for those that don't know, Marissa Williamson is also a NADOC Sports Person of the Year. Are you the most recent? Is it are you last year? Yeah. yeah. You're, the, you're the reigning. Um, you're yeah. <laughs> current. Well, none can be. how long it's going to be for, too. <laughs> Can't get rid of me. But um, what, what, what was it like from a cultural point of view to be recognised by your mob and, and the Victorian community as a leader? but also a, a, a champion in mean, sports. It's a pretty general sports award and winning that. Haley had really amazing thoughts about it just being, rec- you know, it's a pretty big award for the Victorian community, but you've also done some pretty amazing things outside of community. How did that pale or compare to being recognised by um, I think boxing community versus Indigenous community? The NAIDOC award was definitely the the most important award that I've gotten, the best award I've gotten. Like, I wouldn't I wouldn't be a champion if I didn't get the NAGOC award. Um, mm. And culturally, it was, I was just confused because I've never been around that many black fellas before. I was in white, white homes and I just, I didn't really, I didn't, I could, didn't have a full grasp, was I black? Like, I didn't, I don't, <laughs> I didn't call myself black at the time. I was just like, yeah, people are. So I was just like, yeah, I'm Aboriginal. My mum's Aboriginal. And I just didn't, I just, I didn't have a sense of identity or belonging. And that's obviously because I was in out of home care for a really long time. I just, but when I was at the NADOC, I didn't have a full grasp of how um, important the award was and what it meant until I did the first speech. 
Mm. And then I realized, and I was like, oh, like, this is, this is who I am. This is where I belong. This, this is my mob. And that was, that I didn't have that until the award. And now I carry it on me, like, on my sleeve type of thing. Um, it's brilliant. Yeah, I just, yeah. The boxing community is good, um, but it doesn't make, doesn't make me the fighter who I am. The indigenous community does. Is there much cultural appropriation in in boxing? Are they are they are they good with that, uh, or they don't really care about that? <laughs> it's all right. Do they not really address that? No, sp- you know, I know the sports, NBA, AFL, are all doing things. What's boxing like? Boxing Australia, they just got Brad Hall, who's an Indigenous Olympian, who went to the two thousand Olympic Games, um, to design fight strips for. Um, there's elite fighters who go into major competitions, mm. um, which is, and Paul Fleming did one as well. Mm. He's also an Indigenous pro boxer. And then obviously Jamie Pitt, the Aboriginal, he's the Australian picture coach. Um, and he does a lot of work with the Olympians at the AAS and he went to, he went to the Athens Games. Um, I have been told by one coach to stop with my politicalness around the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm. Um, for the sake of your career kind of attitude? Yeah. Like being, yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. Interesting, um, interesting. That kind of just was more ammunition for me to just keep going. Like I got my I got my boots painted up and I'm, design, I'm designing a fight hoodie with Marley Marley. Um, she's going to be doing um, my design. We're working on it at the moment with a graphic designer who's also, she's not Aboriginal, but she's um, colour. Um, it kind of just made me start designing hoodie and get my my fight boots painted by um kaya nicholson ward um i was i was like okay then all right let's just every way and i'm going to be wearing a clothing in the gap yeah so it's strange i'm i'm a i'm a good friend of danny green's and i just think about his patriotism 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 i don't know what the word is patriotic ways when he's in the ring you know he, he he really uses the australian flag and you know, when he's fighting for world titles a few mm. years back, he's always about, you know, come with me, Australia, like get on my back. And, and a lot of a lot of Aussies get behind him, like, and that's because of his, you know, that Australian pride. I don't, I don't see any difference in a First Nations person saying, well, this is my pride and I'm going to wear my colours on my back. It's, 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 yeah. it's, a, it's an issue, but I'm glad that you're not... I don't think you're one that's going to oh, be it just uh, makes swayed me, too easily. It's like putting petrol in the fire or just like... Yeah, yeah. I, was like I was just crying in anger because I wanted to punch something all in a lockdown. I was like, I can't do anything. And I was like, just really anger, angry. <laughs> um, but I was saying in another interview that I was uh, the video is going to be released in a few weeks that in the next five to ten years, I want to be getting off the plane with an Olympic gold medal around my 100%. Neck. Aboriginal flag, and it's just going to be flying. So, like, crap. you're going to do it. You're going to do it. You got some heaps of comments coming in on the chat, and I'm sorry you can't can't see them. I wish I could see them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Tash Tash Charles, Mike is so inspiring for our Indigenous youth. Shell, this little warrior is 18. West Side, she obviously hears it from Werribee. <laughs> Smash those molds and wear those scars. You are amazing. Uh, Sue Ann Hunter, good morning, gorgeous girl. Kesley, well done, Marissa. You will fly high. Uh, Chris, uh, Shell had to go, but she said it's an amazing story. Such an amazing story, Chrissa. Hey, before we have to head off um, and let you probably go catch up on a bit more sleep, maybe or something, <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about your recent scholarship and, and how that came about. So, uh, so funny. So they on the Futures program, we have a Futures group chat now because obviously COVID, so we can't, you know, Jamie Pittman can't come to see us. We can't go to the AIS. And um, he's like, you know, this is a really good opportunity. He posted it and I started applying. So you have to choose between T1, 2 or 3 when you're applying and you have to make a decision. I was like, there's no one going to get T1 because that's like the biggest one. It's $10,000 scholarship and then a full mentoring. Um, and I was like, you know what, stuff it. I'm here for it. Let's just do it. And then I stopped applying halfway through and I was like, um, and then I had extra time and I was like, okay, I'll just keep going. I was like, there's probably no way I'm going to get this. Caitlin Parker, who's an Olympian, um, she's medaled at Youth Worlds and World Games and all this stuff, Commonwealth Games. She's just been everywhere. And I was like, I'm definitely not going to get this because Caitlin Parker, my idol, has gotten it and I haven't. Like, I'm just, her career is just, like, she's just 
crazy. Mm. Um, so I just applied. I was like, okay. And then I forgot about it and I was at work and then I got a call and she's like, Bonnie, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, who's this? I don't, I've literally forgot. And um, I was like, oh my God. I realized it clicked in my brain. I was like, oh my God. And I was like, and then she said she was going to call Jamie Pittman and Jamie Pittman knows me a lot because, you know, I was calling him about getting gear and stuff for the nationals and have a coach. What do I do? I'm having a mental breakdown. And he's just like, it's all right. Yes. We got this. So, um, um, the, the, uh, then got the call back and then got the award. So then they, uh, we did stuff with the media and then, then they announced the award and that usually, usually have the award night at the MCG, um, in the museum. Mm. Um, so that's a ten thousand dollars scholarship to go towards boxing next year, and then you get mentored. I get mentored by Kelly Bonas. She um, is a three-time Olympian for volleyball, beach volleyball, um, and that's she incredible. did. She was in volleyball for ten years and beach volleyball for another ten years. So she, we we zoomed yesterday, and, and she's just going to be here supporting me, um, just kind of giving me tools in my toolbox to help me get to the Olympics 2024. You're so incredible, Marissa. I, I'm, I'm listening to this for the first time, if anyone's kind of wondering as well. Um, so it's really raw and fun and exciting and your journey. I was just thinking while you're talking, I hope you, I mean, you're, you really value other people in your corner, but I find you're, you're the inspiration for people to get in your corner. It's, it's, it's really impressive and um, it's a credit to you and it's a, it's a real highlight on human spirit, you know, as we are fighters naturally, like we're survivors, like we all are survivors, but in particular, your story seems like one that might not have gone the way that it has. So um, congratulations to you and, and you are only 18 and it's so crazy. You're so impressive and uh, you don't look like you need um, too much more, uh, well, you, encouragement's great, but you are a, a self-starter and... I'm encouraged by your story. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. But thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'll see you. I'm sure I'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> thanks. thanks so much. Thank you so much, Marissa.